okay, I have to map this area, but I can't get to it, right? I, I actually can't access it either because, you know, it's unsafe or, you know, the road is, there's a landslide or something like this. And I think, you know, being able to truly map remotely, right, without having to drive all over a site is something that opened up a lot of possibilities for us. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun, and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 318. Can drones save the mining industry money? Today's guest believes they can. And not only that, He says drones can make the industry safer. William Pryor is a technology evangelist at Skycatch, a drone data and analytics firm. The company provides aerial data capture and analysis tools, complete with onboarding, training, and support. Many of the world's largest companies use Skycatch across all of their work sites. Mining companies use Skycatch to precisely measure how much dirt they're moving. An improvement of the margin of error in the volume calculations by just 1% can result in saving over $300,000 a year per mine. That's a significant benefit. In this edition of the Drone Radio Show, William talks about Skycatch, its focus on serving the mining industry, and the benefits of using drones, autonomy, and machine learning in mining operations. But before we hear from William, I want to thank those of you who are supporting my funding campaign. Whether it's a dollar, $100, or much more, you can help defray the cost of production and keep the podcast going and growing. Go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate. And by the way, if you have a great story on the use of drones and you'd like to share in a podcast, contact me at Randy at DroneRadioShow.com. So let's find out how drones are saving the mining industry money while making it safer with William Pryor of Skycatch. Let's pick up the interview where I asked William to introduce himself. I'm William Pryor and I'm the product evangelist at Skycatch. In that role, I work between uh, product, marketing, and, and sales. I help identify challenges for our target customers and I partner with them to find ways to have our high precision data fix those problems. William, for those that are not familiar with the company, what does Skycatch do? Skycatch is a drone mapping company. We've been around since 2013. We were incorporated early 2013. Based in San Francisco, we have offices uh, in Mexico, also Australia and Europe. And we're focused on high precision mapping solutions with drones. We have been a, a hardware manufacturer, so we've, we've manufactured drones. You know, nowadays we're really focused on tools, both hardware and software tools that make collecting accurate data and working with that data easier. What are the key industries that the company serves? Through our history, we've had a, a substantial focus on mining and, and construction. And that remains true to this day. So really, uh, we work with some of the biggest uh, you know, mines in the world, my, mining companies, also, you know, small ones scattered around and uh, quite active in the construction industry as well. And we've been fortunate to be deployed on some, you know, historic, really awesome construction projects, you know, both in the U.S. and, and abroad. There are a number of companies that specialize in aerial mapping data and mapping itself. How does Skycatch differ? That's a great question. And, and I love this space because it's a very interesting space. What makes Skycatch different, I would say, is a couple things. First is that we provide a total solution for high accuracy mapping. So there's a lot of components to that. There's a field component actually flying the drone. There's an accuracy component, which has to do with you know, how we position the, the data that goes in and the data that goes out. And then there's a sharing aspect too, which is you know, when you go on the web or uh, you know, share this, this 3D data with, with people who care about it. So, so we do all of those things. As I said before, We've manufactured drones. We have some awesome patents and, you know, we've done some very interesting things, you know, as a drone manufacturer, we still manufacture hardware, mostly an accessory or, you know, accessories that help with really two things. One is uh, it's a GPS base station that 
corrects you know, drone GPSs and also does photogrammetry processing. We still make hardware. If it doesn't fly, it's, it's on the ground, but it's a part of this accuracy puzzle. Um, and then we also write our own software that does the photogrammetry processing. So if you work with Pix4D or, or Agisoft, Skycatch, we have a team that develops our own uh, photogrammetry or structure from motion uh, software stack, and that runs on our dedicated field device. And then as a last thing, you know, we do have a web tool as well. All of our process data goes to the web. It's shareable to, you know, multiple team members. And then we have, you know, analyses that you can do on the data. So, you know, our primary product is the high precision package. And literally it's, it's everything that you need in a box to start, you know, precision mapping, survey grade mapping, and we do it all. In terms of the end user benefit, is it more accurate data or a faster turnaround of the data? That's a great question. And I would say it's, we make it much easier to collect accurate data and we also deliver it, you know, much faster without any cloud connectivity. So yes, more accurate and, and, and yes, the faster, it's kind of both. How long has the company been around? We started in 2013, really exciting time, you know, in the early drone industry, I think. Um, and, you know, what we formed the company to do, and this is, you know, the vision of our CEO, Christian Sands, was that we saw the potential that drones had in the in industry at the time. And, and, and I, knew, I know that you were an early sort of visionary seeing that as well, sort of getting interested in drones early on. We saw that drones had a huge potential, but they were very hard to use, right? These are in the days of, you know, you couldn't go to Best Buy and buy a drone. You know, if, if, if you wanted a drone, you had to make one. So making it easier to use a drone to do the things that you wanted was really the initial vision of the company. And so to do that, we built the Skycatch ground station, which is a self-deploying drone, lives in a uh, protected box. It was designed to be located you know, on a construction site or, or a mine site and then deployed remotely, right? So, so someone wants to look at something, someone wants to map, they can send a mission to the drone and the drone will go out and fly and, and return. So we, we actually built that system uh, probably through 2013 and, and some of 2014 and had some really interesting deployments with it, some uh, really great use cases. This is an excuse that you hear a lot of the time, you know, oh, we were too early. But the fact is, you know, then and now the FAA doesn't really have any published rules around this sort of remotely operated flight, right? Like, you know, BV loss is about as advanced as, you know, the, the FAA gets. But then the idea of having, you know, an unpiloted drone, you know, a, a drone that's operating autonomously is still not really covered. So, you know, we, we have this powerful device that we could, you know, put it on a site and, and collect data about that site remotely. And in deploying it, you know, what became very interesting to us is, you know, how are people really using this, this data? You know, what are the things that, that this drone can help people discover? And that's when we began to focus on this, you know, precision mapping, precision survey. And we did it in, you know, again, con construction and, and mining. So from those early ideas around, you know, how do we make it easier to get to the end point? You know, first we attacked the sort of drone system. Once we learned about that and, and uh, you know, flight planners became available, things like that, we really decided to focus on the data. So what were the kind of analytics, uh, you know, that drones were good at creating? You know, this is things like topo mapping, cut and fill, progress tracking for construction, high wall mapping, geotechnical analysis, you know, things that I'm sure a lot of your, your listeners will be familiar with. Skycatch had an early association with the Komatsu Corporation out of Japan. What did that association do for Skycatch? It was the success and really the splash that we made with that early auto landing drone, which we called Evo 2, this self-landing, self-deploying system. Komatsu is a, a you know, Japanese company that makes earth moving equipment. They're global. And they have a technology focus. I think they saw what we were doing with this you know, system that made it very easy to capture data. And they also knew that, you know, at the time, drones were an ideal method to collect site data for their earth-moving vehicles. So in uh, late 2014, we began to, you know, enter into a partnership discussion with Komatsu. They ultimately became, you know, not only one of our biggest customers, but also uh, an investor. So what that did for us is it's pretty incredible. I think this was a, a big period in, in Skycatch which taught us a lot about, uh, you know, operating globally. It taught us a lot about accuracy. And ultimately what, what Skycatch became was, you know, we became the eyes 
for a you know totally robotic construction solution that that Komatsu was designing, and it's called smart construction. You know, you can imagine drones flying over the job site, collecting 3D data, sending updates to you know a centralized system that builds jobs for the robots to execute on the site, uh, and then those jobs will be issued to the machines, and then you know the machines do the work. So. I think that probably the biggest scale of this vision is, you know, we can drop a, but we can send a bunch of equipment, you know, to a site and the equipment operates autonomously over the course of a few months, you know, and people come back and the site is ready. Yeah. Working with the Japanese was, uh, was amazing. They, they certainly love robotics and there's a safety focus that comes along with that. I think the thing that we benefited from the most really from, from that relationship is their focus on precision. You know, I had the opportunity to go to Japan numerous times, and I think just about everything the culture does is is very precision focused. You know, there's there's sort of a right way to do everything, and it was taking drone maps from okay, here's a system to easily collect data, uh, you know, and, and deliver it to uh, this you know topo mapping system to go from that step into say okay, we can get a survey accurate measurement, you know, at, at any time using Skycatch. And, and really holding us to that standard, you know, it, it really matured us a lot. And, um, you know, they put us right in the office along with their, you know, executive who, who directed this smart construction program. And when client data didn't come back and it didn't look good, you know, we, he, would, he would sit down with us and, and have a very sort of, you know, stern but supportive talk. And so that's when I think the seriousness, I guess I should say, of, of working with surveyors, working in, with survey equipment, you know, became really evident to us. So, you know, they, they elevated us globally and they also challenged our technology a, a great deal. And I think we, we learned a lot. As a result of the experience, did Skycatch refocus or redirect its energies in any particular direction? What we learned early on, right, when, when we first brought our tech into Japan and, and elsewhere and Komatsu helped us, you know, start to scale it, is that there's a lot of field work that goes into creating good drone maps and it was very hard to control that process because now you have a drone pilot, right? Who's maybe working with surveyors and engineers. And so maybe we have access to the drone pilot, you know, talking to them about different considerations they need to make to collect accurate data, but they may not be able to you know, pass that information on to, to everybody on the site. I think the thing that we you know, gained the most from that or the, the way in which we changed was that we realized we had to make it a lot easier to collect good data. And the simplest way that we did that was, well, we, we decided to try and eliminate the ground survey portion of drone mapping. You know, it's for anybody who listens to your show and, and knows about ground control and uh, GCPs and things like that. It's kind of ironic when you want to collect a, a great drone map with a conventional method, right? Using, using a lot of ground survey, people will say, okay, you know, I, I can collect a really accurate map of your site. The first thing we have to do is we have to go on the site and map it out. And that's basically setting the ground control points. So it seems a little, a little counterintuitive. We adapted some you know, very well-established technology called RTK GPS, which is just basically high-precision GPS. It's used in survey devices. It's used in self-driving cars. Um, and we were one of the first to you know, adapt it to a multi-rotor drone, which allowed you know, a user to basically, they didn't need to set any ground targets you know, in order to get uh, this, this high accuracy uh, survey result. So, you know, we did it in order to simplify the process that people were taking in the field to collect good data. You know, we just needed more consistent results from these many people that we were training in Japan. And what it ultimately did is it, it opened up a huge series of applications for us, which really brought us into mining survey, which have to do with okay, I have to map this area, but I can't get to it, right? I, I actually can't access it either because, you know, it's unsafe or, you know, the road is, there's a landslide or something like this. And, and, I, and I think, you know, being able to truly map remotely, right, without having to drive all over a site is something that opened up a lot of possibilities for us. Can you describe how autonomy and machine learning interact on mining sites? One of the byproducts of autonomy is, you know, you, you get rid of... St- human steps that can cause error, right? If, if, if it needs to you know, work autonomously, we remove the, the capability for introducing human error. And so automatically, if you will, automatically collecting great data, accurate data is, is, is really what we do. 
There's other parts to that autonomy, one of which is that, you know, we have an autonomous vehicle, right? We have the drone flying waypoints. And in a mining context, we'll work with other autonomous vehicles who are like the self-driving uh, trucks in, in some of these mines. So, you know, we've, we've gotten into this very interesting, you know, machine to machine space where, you know, now I think of the drone like has robot coworkers, basically. And, you know, the big mining companies are really driving this, this initiative, which if you really want to take it to the sort of, you know, big brain level, it touches on interplanetary exploration, right? We actually just had a drone flight on a remote planet for the first time. So this sort of machine to machine collaboration is, is something very interesting. Where Skycatch shows up is, you know, we are the eyes, we're the, we're the 3D eyes that can tell you what's going on on the site. And then, you know, lots of other robots can come in and, and, and sort of work with that common operating picture. The term resilient infrastructure seems to be gaining popularity. What does it mean and how does Skycatch further the concept? Resilient infrastructure, you know, that really makes me think of the concept of a, of a digital twin, which is another place where Skycatch shows up. And, you know, digital twin is a word that's used to describe basically a, a computer model of something, but it, it embodies more than just like, you know, what it looks like, but it's also, you know, what function does it have? What is it, what is it made out of? And so I know there's a huge infrastructure push in the U.S. today. Digital twins will become a huge part of that. And I think what technologies like Skycatch can do is, you know, we can embody the digital twin with the actual physical appearance and, and dimensionality of this object that we're talking about. So whether it's bridges, I think, are, are getting a lot of, you know, interest right now. And for resilient infrastructure, you know, having a high precision digital twin of your piece of infrastructure bridge, pipeline, you know, wind farm, solar farm, these are, these are all places that we've been used. To me, that is a part of the resilient infrastructure of the future because, you know, you have a computer model, the actual physical item that, that, that you're working on, and it's sort of this living, breathing model. How does a digital twin work in practice and how is it used in decision making? That's a great question. So when I think broadly about the Skycatch field of applications, where we find success is we find success in any business where part of the business is changing the environment, right? There are two particular things that come to mind, right? Construction and mining. Construction, you know, if you look at it from a very high level, you know, construction is a business which takes money and changes the environment by, you know, building these buildings and, you know, places we live and shop and work. In mining, you know, changing the environment is also part of that picture, Right. You know, there's valuable ore in the ground. We want to get the ore out and then we want to sell it, right? So, you know, very fundamental to the nature of these businesses is that they are changing the environment by definition. And that's where this like living digital twin comes in, right? The, the physical dimensionality of what you're doing, right? How much concrete did we pour today? Are we on schedule to raise the building by, you know, one floor per week or alternatively, did we dig enough or, you know, to meet the customer demand for the next month? Are we uh, in compliance for the design of our large mine, right? These are distinctly physical characteristics. This floor in the building is either there or it's not there. And we help quantify what those things are. So traditionally, you know, the real world has been kind of hard to quantify, right? Like people use something like a ruler or, you know, ruler measuring tape survey gear, right? This idea that now you can actually capture the entire, you know, physical characteristics of something is a fairly new concept, right? It allows us to measure in ways that we've not been able to measure before. And the last thing I would add, you know, is that when we're talking about drone data capture, it's actually a passive data capture method, right? Unlike say laser scanning or, or certain types of survey, you know, the drone is in the air, the drone is not on the ground, it's not in people's way. The drone scan can occur without anyone you know, being interrupted, without stopping anybody else's work. So for these industries now, you know, by introducing drone mapping, you have a passive data capture mechanism that allows you to measure things that, you know, things that are very critical to your business, critical to your profit and loss, and to your customer satisfaction as well, which weren't able to be quantified before. So that's why I actually use the term quantifiable accountability, right? Quantifiable accountability is something that we offer to people who can't be at the mine site or at the construction site, executives who need to know how the business is performing or, or how the project is performing, you know, they can log into Skycatch and they can really quantitatively see what's happening, you know, to the dollars that they're spending to run the business. 
So that's really, the, I think, the core of, of, of what we're all about and you know, what sort of my, my personal mission is about is making more sense of these ways that we can measure our environments and, and measure the earth. In the mining industry, drones are increasingly used for something called high wall scanning. Can you describe what that is and how drones are used? High wall scanning is, is an evolution of the, the different things that we've been trying to do in mining. Miners are, are typically moving, you know, massive amounts of earth, right? We can think of these mining trucks, right? I've been in one that's like bigger than my house. And a lot of mining survey, you know, deals in relatively rough measurements for that reason. We're not talking about millimeters. We're talking about, you know, maybe uh, centimeters. You know, that's, that's the sort of a, you know, earth moving part of mining. There's another part of mining, which is really safety critical. Uh, and that's the sort of geotechnical aspect, right? So, you know, the, the mines that we work with, just to clarify, Randy, are all open pit mines. So these are not like underground shafts or anything, right? These are quite large holes in the ground that we're removing ore from. And the actual stability of the rocks around this hole is, is critical. It's required basically worldwide for, you know, geotechnical engineers to be analyzing, you know, the stability of these very large excavation projects. And there have been some very massive, you know, landslides due to improper monitoring. You know, in Salt Lake City, not, not too long ago, I want to say this was, uh, this was right before we started the company, actually. There was like, the, you know, it was the world's largest man-made landslide, you know, happened because there was a mining pit wall that collapsed. Thankfully, didn't injure anybody, but, you know, they basically, they lost about six months because they had to dig themselves back out, right? So what the high wall scanning product does is we use a drone to fly autonomously, right? We do terrain following with the drone. The camera is facing at the you know, wall of a mine. If you can picture a mine, it usually kind of cut out like stair steps. And we'll use the photos from the drone. Um, you know, D we work at DJI Phantom 4, for example, and we'll process that data at super high resolution so that we're getting back, you know, multiple points per inch. And we can very accurately model the, you know, the rock fractures and patterns that are in the wall that will affect its, its stability. It's done today by a lot of miners, you know, using laser scanners mounted on vehicles. So, you know, they'll have to drive into the mine, you know, basically press go on the scanner and the scanner will take a minute or something to, to capture the data. But because it's uh, ground-based, you know, there's a safety consideration. More and more mines are going autonomous, right? We want to keep the people away from the autonomous vehicles. And, and overall, you just want to keep the, you know, small vehicles like pickups and the, the pickup trucks that surveyors use, you know, you want to keep them outside of that mining area. So we present a better aerial view. We can see more. There's no shadowing. We achieve this very high accuracy, you know, 3D output that geotechnical engineers will then use to say, you know, okay, where are the fractures in the rocks? Are they pointing in the right direction? You know, have we cut the wall to a good angle or is there some risk here and maybe we need to, you know, modify the design? So it's a very natural evolution to the kind of surveying and, and mapping that we've done to date. We sort of, you know, turned everything up to 11 and we're able to get results that are quite comparable to laser scanning. How often is high wall scanning typically done? It's whenever a new you know, area is exposed, right? So I think there's you know, maybe a conventional surveying that's done in a mine, you know, with topo surveying that's like, you know, how, how much did I dig today? A surveyor once told me, I think high wall is something like 20 to one. So there'll be 20 standard surveys you know, for every high wall survey that they do. Although that, they know that high wall survey will have a much kind of higher demand on, on the data. So it's going to be something like once a week in a, your average large mine. How are the services deployed? So we focus on providing the technology, right? We're not a pilot network. There are some great pilot networks out there that we work with, but you were usually selling to people and companies that have operators already. So, you know, um, in Australia, like I would say, which has a, a very advanced drone and, and surveying uh, market, most of the surveyors that I meet, you know, they, they're also drone pilots as well. So this was different, you know, before part 107 and before 333, you know, there was always the big question of who's flying the drone. I think for our target markets, there are drone operators in the companies that we sell to, right? So, you know, surveyor slash drone operator is probably our, our number one user. Let's talk about environmental monitoring. 
What does Skycatch offer in that area? This comes right from our customers. You know, I think in, in what I do is like, I basically moonlight with our customers and, and learn about their gripes and their problems and things that we can solve with, with drone data. One of the things that came up was what's called tailings dams. So, so tailings monitoring, this is like, as you dig up, you know, stuff from the ground, the things that are not, you know, what you ultimately want to pass out, like, you know, at a gold mine, it's everything but the gold, right? Everything but the gold is basically, you know, tailings. So these are, uh, you know, waste products that they don't want to end up in the output. Depending on what they are, sometimes uh, the, the companies have to store them on site and they're, they basically will build like a dam, which will, you know, contain all of the uh, mining runoff, right? And they'll basically place it in the dam, you know, and keep it on site, sometimes doing environmental remediation, uh, you know, down the line. But you can imagine the strength and the um, reliability of these dams is absolutely key, right? And I know that there was not too far from where you are, there was a uh, problem at a, I believe it was like a phosphate mine near you in Florida. A company was having, a, I think, like a leakage issue with one of these mines. So basically, we, we help our clients with early identification of any issues that come up with these dams, right? We do focus on that sort of all aerial mapping. When we do introduce ground targets, you know, into the mapping on top of the high precision that we provide, we can get into very, very high, you know, detail, like sub-centimeter detail. And so with a couple of flights a month, our mining customers can use Skycatch to see, okay, we have an area in the wall that is moving a little bit, you know, week to week. We need to take a look at this and understand, you know, is there something seeping out of the wall? Is it being eroded at the bottom? you know, how can we keep the containment secure, right? And again, it's, it's all passive. It's, it's not like some of these ground-based, you know, surveying methods. Sometimes it might be unsafe to send somebody, you know, to the bottom of one of these dams that has questionable, you know, performance, you know, is holding back some, uh, you know, nasty material. You don't want to send a person down there. So, you know, instead what we would do is have our customer send the drone in and the tools that we provide allow them to track change over time. William, what's the future hold for Skycatch? What's next for the company? You know, something that I see happening right now and really exciting is we'll be compatible with more and more drones, right? With the introduction of the DJI Phantom 4 RTK, that was really the first, you know, off the shelf, high precision drone that, that, that we could work with. A lot of people are excited about the M300 coming out this year. So, you know, adding more drones that, that, that we support. We're also looking uh, outside of DJI and we are introducing support for, you know, some other brands, well-known brands of drones in the survey space, right? So make, making Skycatch compatible, um, you know, with more data collection systems, that is, you know, sort of, I would say, our, our kind of near-term focus. And it's going to mean a lot to our customers this year, I think. We're, we're going to be able to work with more people than ever. Thinking longer term, the challenge has always been in geospatial industry, there are so many amazing ways to collect data now. Being able to manually analyze all this data is becoming nearly impossible, right? Just a huge data stream. So, you know, for that longer term vision for, for Skycatch, it fits really well with our, you know, autonomy, you know, let's make it easier to, you know, fly the drone. Let's make it easier to collect good data. Let's make it easier to do the analysis that we want on some of this data. So we'll be doing more in the machine learning space. Our customers will have terabytes or petabytes of project information that they may want to go back and say, okay, you know, when was, uh, the, you know, uh, let's say uh, the uh, water utilities being installed in the ground, right? They don't want to have to comb through all the aerial data and say, okay, here, I see a pipe going into the ground. They want an automated system that will do that. So really automated analytics, for our customers is going to be, you know, a longer term focus as we see, you know, more ways to get data into the Skycatch pipeline, supporting more drones, you know, supporting potential for uh, ground-based systems as well. But being able to do automated analysis on that data is really where we're starting to go. And we're working with our partners right now to say, okay, what are the most, you know, very high volume tasks, right? Very manual tasks, helping them automate some of those things and then making those analyses available to our, to our greater customer base. When you speak to new clients, what's the value proposition or the commitment they can expect from Skywatch? 
you know, I think anybody who's, who's sort of worked in the drone space, you know, commercially knows that setting expectations is key, right? Dr- drones, are, I think, are fun and, uh, you know, an incredible tool. You know, and when you're enthusiastic, it's either, it's easy to overstate, you know, what, what the drone can do. So our commitment is easy to use, right? Robust results, high accuracy. You know, our Edge One system using this, you know, ground-based exterior, we can make drone data much more accurate and, and much easier to get every time. And then, you know, we work with you to determine, you know, where we want to set that accuracy bar. Do we want it to be super tight? Do we set that margin a little bit bigger? So, you know, that's what the commitment to the customers would be is we bring our experience to bear. We've seen almost all the, the challenges that can happen in, in collecting accurate data, and we'll make it easier for you, you know, to get the results that you need to get for high accuracy applications. And for my final question, William, what message would you like to leave regarding autonomous mapping with drones? I would say, you know, to be successful, choose something that will give you results every time. What I counsel people in, in the industry on a lot is, you know, focus on that low hanging fruit. You know, there, there are incredible things that the drones, you know, could do, right? If with the right regulations in place and the right payloads and things like this, you know, I, w- I would say st- start small, right? S- start with something that will really reliably give you results, whether it's, you know, wanting to make a map of your job site every week. It doesn't need to be survey grade. Just see what happens when you upgrade from, okay, just doing a video update to doing something maybe that's more measurable now, right? And so just stay realistic about what you want to get out of it. And, you know, drones are so powerful that the real value proposition for any drone application, it may be actually, you know, much closer to, uh, you know, reality than you think. You, You may not have to stretch too far and go into the world of unexplored, you know, opportunities to, to find your true value. So that's a humble pie that I've eaten over the years. And uh, I think it, it will make any technologist, you know, successful with deploying technology. Really focus on those minimum results that you want to get. Think of an elegant solution. Think of a reliable solution. And once you have that down, you're going to learn a lot about your you know, problem space. And then you can iterate and, you know, tune things a little bit. That's it for episode 318 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from William Pryor of Skycatch. I want to thank William for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about Skycatch or want to connect with William, check out the website at skycatch.com. If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, go to DroneRadioShow.com slash donate. And thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me, and I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.